success and well-being during uncertain times. So our first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. So I'll be looking for a mover and a seconder that the agenda for the regular meeting of the board of January 18th, 2022 be approved as printed. Trustee McComb as a mover and seconded by Trustee Morgan. Thank you. All in favor? Thank you, that's carried. I must say I like the counting system on the side of our new um, Teams meeting. It's very helpful in the uh, process here. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest on any of the items on our agenda tonight? I see none. So we have a couple of uh, minutes to approve. Uh, first, we'll be looking at the minutes of the initial meeting of the board of December 7th, 2021 be approved as printed. Could I have a mover, please? Trustee Atkinson and seconded by Trustee McComb. Thank you. All in favor? Thank you, that's carried. And our second set of minutes were the minutes of the Committee of the Whole Board meeting of January 4th, 2022 be approved as printed. Could I have a mover please? Trustee, er, Trustee Johnstone and seconded by Trustee Dawson, thank you. All in favor? Thank you, that's carried. Uh, is there any business arising from the minutes that won't be covered on our agenda tonight? I don't see any. And uh, so that takes us to our excellence in education. I would like to invite Superintendent of Education, Keith Lefebvre, uh, to speak introduce this report, but I'll first be looking for a mover and a seconder that the Blue Water District School Board receive the woman in the trades report for information. I see Trustee Morgan and Trustee Dawson and welcome Superintendent Lefebvre. Thank you very much, Chair Thompson. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce you um, to people who uh, probably don't need much of a, a formal introduction because they've been here before. Andrea Rideout is our experiential learning lead with Blue Water District School Board and Dave Barrett is our Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program Coordinator, um, our OEAP coordinator. And they're here tonight to talk about women in the trades and all of the great work that we're doing within Blue Water um, to support uh, young women in the trades. Um, Andrea and Dave, I'm going to turn it right over to you immediately. Thank you, Superintendent Lefebvre. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, present to the Blue Water District School Board this evening. Just making sure you can see the first page of our presentation. We're good? Yes, yep, we're All good. right, so my colleague Andrea Rideout from Experiential Learning are really excited to discuss the many opportunities that uh, for young women to explore the apprenticeship pathway that have already happened so far this year. And I'll turn it over to Andrea to start the presentation. Thank you, Dave. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for inviting us to share with you tonight. Uh, sometimes our events have the specific focus of uh, women in the skilled trades, and other times this theme is interwoven throughout the event through discussions uh, or role model exposure. So first I want to talk with you this evening about um, a project that we launched in the fall. Uh, it was designed for our grade 7 and 8 students specifically, and it was called Character for All. Intermediate students all across the board tuned in for a live presentation from NHL Boston Bruins scout Andrew Dixon to learn more about the importance of character growth often on the ice. 
Our goal for this project was to create an engaging experiential opportunity that allows students to learn more about character development. Sometimes you may have heard this referred to as soft skills or global competencies and why they're applicable to everybody in all workplaces, no matter what the pathway. Mr. Yep, thanks, Dave. You can switch to the next one. Perfect. Mr. Dixon did a fantastic job highlighting the importance of demonstrating strong character. And after after sharing some of his experiences, he opened it up for students to take the lead and ask the questions that they wanted to know the answers to. So while some students chose to focus on how do I become part of the NHL, um, and then they also wanted to know if scouts really do take the time to talk to the teachers uh, of the players in question, and the answer to that is yes, by the way. Uh, the conversation took a natural turn um, towards, is there a place for gender inclusion in the NHL? And Mr. Dixon spoke very highly of recent changes within professional sports that show that the profession truly is trending towards more female involvement, which includes AHL female lines people, female NHL scouts, female managers for professional baseball teams. And so he, Andrew really wanted to highlight that females are encouraged to work hard, stick to their goals, and be encouraged that steps are being made towards gender equity and inclusion in many professions. So for this project, we really wanted to shine a light on those important skills that help people navigate personal and workplace relationships. Conflict resolution, teamwork, problem solving, flexibility, dependability, and communication skills. The skills that make it easier to form relationships with people, create trust and dependability, and also lead teams. They're the personal attributes that influence how well you can work and interact with others. And these skills are really needed in every profession that you work in, whether it's working in retail and speaking to customers, or working in the skilled trades and speaking with your colleagues, interacting with your colleagues. These skills are embedded in everything that we do. So the student and teacher principal feedback uh, from everyone was absolutely fantastic for this project. Uh, principals and teachers reported that in their hallways and their classrooms, it was so silent that you could hear a pin drop during the presentation as students were really engaged. Uh, students also reported to the teachers that they thoroughly enjoyed the presentation and felt that there was something for everyone. Uh, one of the students at SDSS um, actually responded that everyone in her class was really engaged, not just the boys who play hockey, and that the girls found it very interesting. They had follow up questions as well. Um, so um, just to kind of follow up uh, what the students did after the presentation, uh, teachers facilitated a reflection activity with students uh, and then students were then encouraged to log into Edge Factor and continue to explore soft skills by delving into the potholes series uh, within uh, Edge Factor. <clears throat> Our next event was our third Build a Dream Expo for young women, and it's the second time that we've had to do it virtually. Um, so this one was hosted on November 24th as our section, second virtual event. And the analytics from it were uh, phenomenal. Um, the second virtual event was bigger than last year's event with a total of 229 registrants. The audience was well balanced, as you can see from the slide, if you can read it. Uh, a nice balance of students from grade 7 to grade 12 that participated in and 4% would have been parents who also participated. And based on the who will be watching with you analytics near the bottom there, uh, we estimate that our total audience was in excess of 580 uh, students for this, this particular event. And it helped us uh, quite a bit because, you know, pre and post surveys were part of this and we we learned some new things and we confirmed some things we already knew. We knew parents pay a big role in uh, students uh, choosing their pathways and exploring their pathways. Second teachers, 75% are big influencers. School counselors at 50% are big influencers and community mentors and others rank fairly, uh, you know, sort of last in that category. And it tells us that we need to continue to ensure that each of these influencers has the best and most up to date apprenticeship information available consistently so that they can help guide these these youth. 
We were thrilled uh, that 75% of the participants in the pre-survey indicated that they were considering exploring careers in skilled trades in STEM and so forth. We were over the moon to learn in the post-event um, um, survey that that number had jumped to 88%. So we had reached some people and, and really sort of solidified that this was these were pathways worth exploring. The surprise for the evening for me was 56% of the participants were interested in entrepreneurship. And this bodes really well for the skilled trades because a significant number of small medium enterprises or what are considered small business by Statistics Canada are in the skilled trade sector. I did a quick search on um, Statistics Canada in 2020, 99% of all construction businesses were small medium enterprises and 93% of all manufacturing businesses in Canada were manufacturing. So this bodes very well for uh, careers in the skilled trades and exposing young women who are saying we also want to explore entrepreneurship. That's great, Dave, thanks. Um, both OEAP and experiential learning continue to have the goal to expand our reach into more and more uh, elementary classrooms. And we were really excited for the, to uh, launch our second annual gingerbread bridge design build and weight challenge this year with our junior classes. So this year's challenge included 11 different grade five and six classes uh, uh, within our K to 12 schools. So this design uh, project was kicked off with by a virtual presentation from Dave, which was fantastic on behalf of our OEAP department. And uh, some students learned for the very first time about what is an apprenticeship and what are the skilled trades. So uh, the presentation highlights the needs for the skilled trades people in our local communities, but also the demand for women working in the skilled trades as well. And it was fantastic because Skills Ontario also uh, provided activity books for students, which were given as a follow up activity as well for students. So we really believe that planting the seed early uh, about the skilled trades that they're both for male and females is a message that we want to share far and wide with our students students. Projects like this one allow for students to uh, have fun and make hands on connections between math, science, art and the skilled trades in a way that's really truly rich and meaningful. So once students were given the bridge specifications, students set to work to plan their uh, design uh, and for their bridge on paper first and then use their gingerbread kit to implement their design. So it was really neat. Um, Allison Wilson from Walkerton District Community School reported that all of her students really enjoyed the task and that her girls especially made connections when they went through the Skills Ontario books, looking at various careers. They were really surprised and really quite happy uh, that these books showcased females in very different roles in the skilled trades. And this was a great springboard to some classroom, uh, meaningful classroom discussion. So just to reiterate, you know, we really feel explicitly uh, outlining the message that career careers and opportunities in skilled trades are for females too is one that students need to hear in many different forms and that could be special speakers, leaders in the field, print resources, advertising. We really believe this uh, message needs to be shared far and wide. So our friends at Peninsula Shores District School, uh, Sean Potsma's class uh, highlighted the connections that his class made to math and science curriculum for this challenge, but also highlighted um, the importance of developing those soft skills, such as working cooperatively, problem solving and clear communication with this challenge. And you can also see here that uh, this, from the students quotes that they made connections to math and science and of course everyone loves testing out that uh, delicious icing as well, which is awesome. All right, so our friends at Northport, Caitlin Gravitt's class, uh, Ms. Gravitt mentioned the importance of exploring teachers, our students interests in exposing students like hers at a very young age to the variety of career opportunities within the skilled trades. And it's neat because students in her class were able to make connections with the OYAP presentation uh, and to their parents working in the skilled trades as well. So of course we have to, uh, we wouldn't have a challenge unless we had prizes. So prizes were awarded for, um, they were sector related prizes uh, and uh, some examples were materials for cookie decorating, 
birdhouse design kits, small hand tools, uh, and that was for the categories of strongest bridge, most creative, and best decorated structures. Our board continues to develop its working relationship with the School College Work Initiative, and together we're able to offer a multitude of opportunities for students. So despite another unique year this year, we've been able to plan and facilitate experiential learning opportunities uh, in a secondary panel, which is fantastic. So in December, students from OSSD um, grade 11 and 12 entrepreneurship course had the pleasure of taking part in a virtual program highlights day, which was hosted by uh, Georgian College staff and faculty. And the purpose of this half day uh, virtual event is for uh, students, uh, senior students to learn more about pathway options and various opportunities that are available to them. And uh, this year we had students explore working with color uh, in design and visual arts. Uh, they also created a business pitch and finally enjoyed a hands on session with faculty from the plumbing program. And this year was a bit different than in previous years. What I enjoyed about this year's presentation is the variety of programs that were highlighted. They included degree programs, diploma and skilled trades pathways. They were equally uh, highlighted. So as you can see from the picture here, uh, approximately half the class were females and um, it was really neat to watch that both males and females were equally engaged into uh, the plumbing tasks, the hands on of connecting the piping to the fasteners. So it was really nice to see that engagement from our females and our males. And the and last, the last uh, event that we, uh, we partnered together on um was our second year of our experiential learning oh yeah partnership on kickstart your future with our students and we had our friend jamie mcmillan uh who's our keynote speaker and we used the edge factor platform with support from our partners in bruce county jamie mcmillan is a longtime advocate for women in the skilled trades and has personally attended many events that we have organized here in blue water over the years She's an iron worker by trade and is actually currently apprenticing again as a boiler maker. Uh, on December 9th, we hosted an, a, an afternoon event with students and teachers, uh, with students and teachers, and then an evening event for students to bring their parents along and out for the community at large. And we were thrilled with the analytics that from this program, the analytics edge fact, this thing's jumping on me, sorry. The analytics from Edge Factor uh, showed more than 1,000 page views during and following the event. And we had over 1,700 educators, students, and parents participating in the afternoon and the evening presentation. So again, very well received. The analytics were quite good. We got to the audiences that we wanted to and uh, had a great event. Um, the, stu the analytics further showed the exploration in all four sectors. So we were watching as the students uh, where they went to and explored, and they explored all four sectors and sections of skilled trades, construction, industrial, motive, power, and service. Um, Edge Factor provided local content, so they're local, really interactive uh, videos and industry overviews, who cares about OEAP video, SHSM, reasons why to participate in the video, and all of this uh, interacted with before, after, and following the event providing lots of time and opportunities for students to explore personal interests and share them with their parents. Further providing uh, consistent information about the opportunities in the skilled trades for our students, as well as our parents, teachers, and the community at large. And the analytics from, uh, yeah, I did that. Andrea. That's great. Thanks, Dave. You make a really good point before I move on to the follow up just around providing students with the ongoing messaging uh, that, you know, skilled trades is a fantastic career for females as well. And I really believe that by providing uh, strong, confident, successful uh, female role models like Jamie McMillan uh, can start girls can start to picture themselves in these careers uh, more. So um, I just was talking with Dave in preparation for this uh, presentation and I was saying that 
on the weekend, like we know that we have a lot of really great resources um, right here in our own community, women entrepreneurs in the skilled trades. So just this past weekend, um, I had uh, Meg from Meg's Drywall at my house to do some work actually for me. So it was really exciting. We had a great conversation to talk about career opportunities for women uh, in the skilled trades. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of that right here in our own backyard. So I know Superintendent Tang, this is a, uh, a name that you'll recognize um, as well because Meg was often a guest at our Women in the Trades uh, evenings that we offered at various secondary schools. So Meg is just as excited as Dave and I are to, uh, you know, when COVID restrictions allow to have some in-person hands-on opportunities at our secondary schools again for our students. So just to, to get back to the follow-up here, um, from our Jamie McMillan Kickstart Your Future event that we had. Um, schools now have one of these kits at their school for their students to take part in a hands-on follow-up activity. Uh, there's a Kidder OYAP car as well, or a Kidder uh, wood cabin for the kids, for students to uh, have some hands-on learning with that. And it's also linked to uh, Edge Factor as well to follow up in the, the sectors that relate to these activities. And to finish our presentation, we're going to leave the final word to our uh, friend and colleague, Jamie McMillan. Currently, we have 4% women in trades across Canada and the United States. And we are really trying to bump up those numbers because we have a huge shortage in the skilled trades. And these are jobs that both men and women can do. And we're, we like to promote a lot of equality and diversity. And employers are actually embracing having more women come onto the sites because now with women and men working together, we're actually working together well as a team. And women are bringing a different and a uh, very creative aspect to the workplace because we have physiological differences from men so we can't work exactly the same so we have to come up with more creative ways to work smarter rather than harder so we actually make a great team when we can work together and put our muscle with our brain and work together and it's actually a great job and it offers uh, financial independence, uh, pension, benefits um, and freedom. Thanks to the huge support we receive from our schools, our teachers, our specialist high skills majors, our administrators, uh, support teams, and our community partners at large, Blue Water is a leader in the number of females exploring opportunities in the skilled trades and the 14 non-traditional trades as specified or identified by the Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development as this chart shows. This is from the ministry. This is what they send me every year. And this is up to 2019, 2020, and Blue Water remains a provincial leader in this area. And I hope we're not over time, but if anyone has any questions, Andre and I are uh, more than happy to answer any. Thank you so much. Do trustees have questions tonight? Trustee Johnstone. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, it, it wasn't really, it's not really a question, uh, but it's really a comment. Um, just this past uh, week, I was in, in a meeting with the Ontario Public School Board, their program committee, and we were actually talking about the, you know, say skilled trades and and programs. And once again, I was able to very much promote and boast about um, our area. And yes, we are recognized uh, provincially in terms of um, how much we're promoting the uh, skilled trades with with women and just skilled trades in general in our area. And um, I guess I now always say this uh, too, is that my middle daughter is an electrician and works for Hydro One. So she's a prime example of a graduate of uh, our, our board and, and eventually went into the skilled trades and is exactly what all the things Jamie said. Awesome, thank you. That's good to hear. It's fantastic. Trustee Morgan. Um, I'd just like to say thanks very much for your presentation. Trades are extremely near and dear to my heart as I was in trades for many, many years and, and do have a ticket, actually. So I'm very proud of that. And so um, thank you so much and keep encouraging the kids. It's all about math, though. You know that, don't you? Oh, and that's we talk about that all the time with the students. Absolutely. 
this is not something you fall into. You earn apprenticeships. So. Yep. Trustee Lutz. Thank you. I wanted to echo what everyone else was saying. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. And I wanted to thank you specifically for elevating the voice of Jamie McMillan as it is so important to elevate the voices of women specifically in the trades when that is what we are trying to promote rather than others talking about it. So thank you very much for that great presentation and all the wonderful work you're doing with our students and for making sure um, her voice was heard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? I had a couple. I just was curious whether uh, the virtual, if you could comment on the pros and cons of being virtual, if there's something to be gained from that or if we lost something. Um, and I did have a second question, but it's unrelated. So I'll let you answer that one first. Uh, um, sorry. Go ahead, Andrea. You're welcome. You can go ahead, Dave. It's okay. Just from, from my perspective, um, predominantly the skilled trades are hands-on so virtually you cannot do hands-on that's been our biggest frustration but that's why it's so great to partner with someone like uh, uh experiential learning and andrea because we we spitball our ideas and we're finding ways to get at least things into the classrooms so that when we have our virtual events the students have something to do with their hands they get to build they get to test they get to fail they get to try again and that's what we see as the most important thing. As Andrea said, we can't wait. We were, you know, she had Meg into her room and Meg has been awesome. And she is a local contractor who can't wait to get in. And we'd love to get back into schools and have, you know, young women come in and try the skilled trades and young men and people on the academic stream. We just want them to try them, but you can't do it in a virtual hour. You got to actually try it. Yeah. That's Thank you. Um Sorry. My second question is you referred to the entrepreneurial businesses that are starting up and around. Um, I'm familiar with a young woman who's moved to our area as a chef uh, and working small businesses out of her home. And I'm wondering, is that something that you look forward to making those linkages uh, with those small entrepreneur businesses or how how does that work in your work moving forward? Uh, for myself, um, I'm always, most of our uh, people who take apprenticeships, most businesses and people who take apprentices in Grey Bruce are small businesses. You know, every, everyone holds up our larger employers, but it's it's the local Fred's Electric that takes on two apprentices and, you know, local plumbers that take on one or two apprentices. And it's those small shops of where everyone sort of builds their confidence gets to the next level that leads to the other, you know, to these great careers. So I'm always looking for those links. You know, we've got 20 cooks who are about to graduate at the end of this semester that I'd love to link with. We, we're always linking them with local chefs because as Chef Bevan says, he's a great chef himself, but he's the first one that kicks the students out and said, I've taught you everything I can and I'm Irish. <laughs> and I know everything, but you need to get with an Italian chef and a South American chef and a Thai chef because you want to learn your craft. And that's those linkages we're always looking for anyone that will come in and share their experiences with our students. Excellent. Thank you. That uh, was an excellent. Go trustee, ahead. Tom, sorry, Trustee Thompson. I hope you don't mind if I jump back into your first question that you asked about the, the positives or the negatives about being virtual. Just to kind of um, add on to what Dave had said as well, there's definitely a lot of, we do a lot of problem solving and collaborating together. But I do have to say that when you look at a, a, a project like uh, Kickstart Your Future with Jamie McMillan, it was really positive that we were able to do that virtually because we were able to reach every single grade seven and eight classroom within the board at the exact same time. So if it were in person, uh, Jamie would, would have to travel from school to school to school and we wouldn't be able to reach as many students. So I, I have to say that we, we were actually giddy in the room as we were watching 
-hmm. people logging on and knowing that for every teacher that logged on that equal that you know equated to 25 to 30 students you know so when we have 50 classes on there times 25 so we're, we're really happy that we could reach so many students at the same time so for us that's very exciting thank you thank you and thank you very much for your presentation it was uh excellent and it's always so exciting to hear what's going on thank you thank you it was moved by Trustee Morgan and seconded by Trustee Dawson that the Blue Water District School Board receive the Women in Trades report for information. All in favor? Thank you, that's carried. Uh, we have no delegations this evening. And uh, so we have some three reports. The first is uh, the recommendations from the Committee of the Whole report. And as you will recall, uh, Vice Chair Johnstone chaired that meeting, so I'll turn this section over to her. And thank you very much, uh, Chair Thompson. And I'm, I'm just going from screen to screen here, so I've got them up now. So um, I'll put the first recommendation on the floor and I will move it and I'll be looking for someone to second it. That the Blue Water District School Board approve that Bruce Peninsula District School students participate in the Algonquin Outers canoe trip from May 19 to 26, 2022, contingent that it aligns with COVID-19 protocols at the time of departure. I'm moving it and I'm looking for somebody to second that. And I see that Trustee Thompson's hand is up. Thank you very much. Um, is there any um, uh, further discussion concerning the motion before you? As we had already previously um, talked about this in Committee of the Whole uh, two weeks ago. Okay, I see none, so all in favor? And that is carried and thank you very much. Uh, the next one is that the Blue Water District School Board approve board policy BP 1411-D accessibility standards as revised for system use. I have moved it and I'm looking for somebody to second that. Thank you very much, Trustee Atkinson. Is there any further discussion um, or comment concerning the motion before you? Go ahead, Trustee Lutz. Thank you. I just wanted to say um, in support of that, that I'm very happy we revised it and hopeful that by adding a little more robustness to us, we we can ensure that going forward our facilities are um, accessible to e everyone in our in our school communities. So thank you. And thank you. And is there any further comments or or questions concerning the motion? Okay, I see none. So all in favor? And that is carried and thank you very much. And then the final um, motion is that the Blue Water District School Board approve board policy BP 6701-D Ontario student record as revised for system use. And can I have somebody second that? I see that uh, uh, Trustee McComb, thank you very much. And is there any uh, further comment, questions concerning the uh, motion before you? And I see none, thank you. All in favor? And that is carried and thank you very much. That's the end of my recommendations for this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, our next one is our business committee of the whole board uh, from December the 7th. Uh, Trustee Dawson is the chair of that uh, uh, 
uh, committee. So I wonder, Trustee Dawson, if you would like to bring us the report and then I will put the two motions on the floor. And first I'll be looking to put this on the floor. Uh, so if I could have a mover and a seconder that the Blue Water District School Board. Um, oh, no, I'll let Jim do the report and then I'll put the motions on. Sorry. Thank you, Trustee Thompson. I'm just, there's two reports. I'm just trying to find the right one. So please bear with me. Okay, here we go. Um, the business committee of the whole board on Tuesday, December 7, 2021. And we received a number of reports. Um, one was from the audit committee, and uh, that is going to be uh, presented as a recommendation at the end of the report. And we also received uh, several items for information. One was an update on transportation. Uh, there was a report from the audit committee, the Abigail Samuel Community School Use uh, report was a verbal report that was presented, also a report regarding the Georgian Bay Community School. So there are two recommendations coming from that, and would you like me to put those on the floor or would you do that? I can do that. Okay, thank you. So I'll be looking for a mover and a seconder that the Blue Water District School Board received the audit committee report outlining the activities of the committee for the year ending August 31st. Could I have a mover, please? I see Trustee Dawson and a seconder, Trustee Atkinson. All in favor? Everybody still there? Yep, great. Thank you, that's carried. And secondly, that the Blue Water District School Board approve the annual report of the Audit Committee for the year ending August 31st, 2021, and forward the report to the Ministry of Education. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? I see Trustee Morgan and Trustee McComb. And all in favor? Thank you, that is carried. And again, we'll invite uh, Trustee Dawson to uh, speak to the Committee of the Whole Board January 4th report. Uh, this one is just um, to receive our report, so I'll put it on the floor. Uh, could I have a mover, please, that the Blue Water District School Board receive the report of the Business Committee of the Whole Board meeting held on January 4th, 2022. I see Trustee Dawson and Trustee Morgan. And Trustee Dawson, could you give us the report, please? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, the uh, committee, business committee of the whole board met on Tuesday, January 4th. And the first item was the election of a chair of business committee. And I was honored and pleased to be acclaimed to that position. Uh, there were several items for information that came forward out of that. We had an excellent presentation on trustee cybersecurity awareness with lots of pointers and advice on how um, we personally as trustees or individuals can keep our, uh, our uh, computer activities secure and also what the board is doing uh, in order to keep the board uh, secure in their transactions. Uh, online. Uh, we also received the 2021-22 interim report uh, for information that outlined revenues and expenditures with a comparison to the approved budget. And it's that time of year again. We uh, also received a report regarding the uh, budget timeline for 2022-23, an update regarding Beavercrest Community School, and uh, uh, a, a report regarding student device opportunities offering a one-to-one -one ratio for, of devices for secondary students and also donations to technology reserve program. So those are the reports that were presented and there's one recommendation coming out of that and I would suggest maybe that uh, Chair Thompson you might want to put that one on the floor. It's on the floor isn't it just to receive the report or am I missing something? Um, there's a recommendation. Would you like me to read the recommendation? 
Sure. Oh yeah, that's what it is. Sorry, never mind. Yeah. Okay. So it was moved by. I, I agree. The cybersecurity was a really excellent report. Thank you very much. It was uh, moved by Trustee Dawson, seconded by Trustee Morgan, that the business or uh, the Blue Water District School Board receive the report of the business committee of the whole board meeting held on January fourth, twenty twenty two. All in favor. Thank you, that's carried. Um, there, there was uh, no committee of the whole board in camera meeting this evening. Do we have any new notice of motion tonight? I see none. So that brings us uh, to the notice of motion that was brought forward. Uh, by Vice Chair John Stone at the January 4th, 2022 Committee of the Whole Board meeting, a safe return to in-person learning in January 2022. Um, I will, or would you like to put this, read this motion, Trustee John Stone? Sure. I just want to make sure I had to come back onto the screen here because I didn't, didn't know if I had unmuted myself, but thank you very much. And when um, um, Trustee John Stone's finished reading this, we'll be looking for a mover and a seconder to put this on the floor for discussion. Go ahead, okay. sorry. Yes. Okay, so it's whereas the provincial government has announced a two week period of virt virtual learning until at least January 17, 2022, and whereas the memo to boards of education from the Ministry of Education dated December 30th, 2021, listed changes to many COVID protocols in schools, including no longer requiring provincial reporting of COVID cases, changes to masking requirements and allowing cohort changes. And whereas the Public Health Ontario, along with Health Canada and Public Health Agency of Canada, PHAC is the acronym, has acknowledged that the Omicron variant is a rapidly spreading airborne virus and that the medical masks provide better protection than cloth masks. And whereas a variety of education stakeholders have issued calls for a return to in-person learning that prioritize student and staff safety, including the Ontario Student Trustees Association, Osti ACO, the Ontario Principals Council, the Elementary Teachers of Toronto ETT, and the Ontario Public School Boards Association, OFSA, of which our board is a member. And whereas throughout the pandemic, child development experts have stressed the primary importance of in-person learning for the sake of student mental health, well-being, and cognitive development. Therefore, be it resolved that the Chair Thompson and Vice Chair J Jan Johnstone write a letter to the Chief Medical Officer of Health of Ontario, uh, Dr. Corinne Moore, the Minister of Education, Stephen Lecce, the Premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, and the Medical Officer of Health for Grave Roos, Dr. Ian Era, emphasizing the importance of implementing a variety of important actions to ensure school can resume safely in person on January 17, 2022. This letter should outline our support of OFSPA's January 2, 2022 statement, which emphasizes the importance of getting students back to in-person learning safely by providing priority access to vaccinations for students and school staff, continued access to polymerase chain reaction, those are PCR testing, non-fit tested N95 masks to school staff as soon as possible, and adding COVID-19 to the list of vaccines in the Immunization of School Pupils Act. And this letter should also stress the importance of a quick and safe return to in-person learning by ensuring that principals continue to report cases of communicable diseases and refuse admittance to students showing symptoms of disease as per the Education Act, and that families and staff be informed of confirmed and suspected cases as reported by guardians and or students COVID-19 cases in individual classrooms. The province continues its commitment to student and staff access to PCR testing in cases of high risk of exposure and suspected COVID-19. 
The province supports and implements a test to return strategy following COVID-19 illnesses and exposure. And the province provides funding and supplies of non-fit tested N95 masks for students in the same way that they are now uh, providing for education staff and request that the Grey Bruce Health continue to report COVID-19 cases for schools and daycare centers. Um, and, and I am um, quite willing to move that and put it on the floor as the original uh, creator of the motion. Excellent. So it's moved by Trustee John Stone. And do I have a seconder, please? Trustee Dawson. So our motion is now on the floor. And uh, just to remind everyone, you get two opportunities to speak to a motion. Um, uh, Trustee John Stone uh, can go first as the mover, um, but everyone else will have, if you're interested, can have two opportunities to speak to this motion. So I will keep track of that and Trustee John Stone, go ahead. Okay, and, and thank you very, very much. And so there, as you know, and you know, uh, in terms of school boards in the province that when I wrote this, um, you know, help create this motion a couple of weeks ago, there was many ch changes that happened after that. And, and I, I do recognize um, that, that there are many uh, recommendations already in this um, motion that have already been followed up by um, the, the, the ministry and I'm quite aware of it, but I felt it important that we leave them in there because, and I'm going to say this quite honestly, how many, you know, other waves are we going to have during this pandemic? And some of those things are going to be just as equally as important. Um, I also um, sent you, uh, and I'm just looking, you know, because I have some different screens in my background running. Um, but as I mentioned, there are boards right across um, Ontario, both Catholic and public that have wrote many similar um, you know, letters to the, the Ministry of Education and to their public health departments. Um, I know that um, within some of those, for example, that I really want to stress um, that I, I, I am very much uh, aware of concerns of our, not only our staff, but also um, the students students and the communities and the parents and guardians that we serve. And so I'm quite quite aware of, of health and safety and, and some of their concerns and that the idea about um, erring on the side of caution is necessary and um, and especially within our schools because we want to ensure that our schools remain safely op uh, safely open. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit um, further here because of the you know additional information that I, I sent and, and one of them has to do with um, masking um, in our schools. And I know that the other motion also deals with that and that student uh, trustees across the province were ca um, calling for that. But I wanted to touch on that, that there has been a growing course of infectious disease doctors right across North America as they have looked at um, COVID-19 and how the different variants have affected individuals and that where they went from um, where you know we just wore say cloth masks that they were very much starting to recommend N95 masks and so I wanted to talk about a little bit about what we call non-fit N95 masks these aren't fitted masks um, and particularly um, not only for our staff but also our students because they do make child size masks um, and that they um, that both the um, the Ontario uh, COVID table as, as well as uh, our Canada's top doctor, Chief Public Health Officer, uh, Teresa Tam, they began advising people actually, in that example, back in November of this, of 2021, of to stop wearing cloth masks and instead use either the three-ply medical masks, but even if possible, and they were saying if it's possible, they were really recommending N95 masks or something very similar. And it has to do with that, that it creates a much higher protection. Um, in thinking about that, and, and you'll notice that I had put up for you is that I was looking at the recommendations recommendations that came out on January 12th from the Ontario Return to School, an overview of the science, and this was from the Science Advisory Table. 
And I put up or I sent you a couple of slides and it talked about different layers of protection, but I really wanted to draw your eye to um, what I would call is the fourth bullet. And what they really recommended there is high quality quality well fitting masks for students, teachers and staff. So they didn't differentiate between students and staff and that um, and that that's why I'm recommending that we 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 write a letter in terms of, of, of actually advocating for that for our students as opposed to what we call the loose fitting three ply mask to students. Um, the other thing I, I I'm going to talk about is just the concern in, in our schools and it is about the fact that even though we have what I call great ventilation in our schools, the fact is is that you know twice a day that kids are removing mass, their masks in school to be able to eat and so we haven't been able to get around that pro that problem. Finally, some of the last key messages that came up, came from that to the COVID Ontario table was once again, they were talking about, um, you know, just preventing the spread of, of COVID and the, of this particular virus. And they talked about the promotion of vaccinations and ventilations, infiltrations, cohorting, testing, staying home when sick. But then again, once again, they said high quality masks mitigate risks of czars cov2 transmission in schools and so it was important to prioritize these resources in schools um my you know when looking at this is that was why you know i really highly recommending that we um that that um that particular bullet be continued to be included in um in uh in in, in our letter to to um, the ministry and to course the other powers to be. I also think that it's really important and I know in talking to different members in our school communities that they we want to ensure that we are continuing to build or maintain public confidence and and they very much want a reporting of possible COVID cases. Now I know that there's a real problem in terms of getting different kinds of testing and that, you know, um, they're being, you know, people are being told, you know, students and staff that if they feel unwell and um, they show these particular signs that they probably are, you know, have COVID and um, so they don't have to have a test. And so we don't get a sense of what the true transmission or, you know, you know, disease in our school. So I'm suggesting there where I change it that even if they're get, getting receiving reports of suspected cases that they be counted and somehow we can um, uh, share that with our families so that they can make their own decisions about the risk in terms of their loved one that attends our schools. Um, I'm just looking at some different things um, and I I did um, also in terms of vaccination, as we already know, we already have a law um, that um, that for unless they have a valid exemption, children who attend primary and secondary school must already be immunized against like diphtheria and tetanus and polio and measles and mumps and rubella, meningitis, and, and these are our communicable diseases, whooping cough. Anyway, um, and so we're advocating and, the, and boards across the province are advocating that um, COVID be also added to that. And that uh, we must be aware that even though they're talking about how um, Omicron is more of a mild, it's much more transmittable, but we must look at our student population. We have five-year-olds who can, you know, that, um, you know, younger children, four-year-olds that can't be vaccinated. We also have in our schools um, really young population of, of students who have only had one shot, maybe, um, and are not maybe even ready for two, and that it's about keeping our schools a safe place for both students and staff to um, learn and work. And thank you very, very much for consideration this evening. Thank you, Vice Chair Johnstone. So I uh, noted that uh, Trustee Lutz had a question and then Trustee Dawson. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say I really appreciate the numerous levels of, um, Sorry, we're at the time of the night where words start escaping me. Basically, all the different um, points in this, I feel 
not only personally, but what I keep hearing from parents and students is the need for um, contact tracing and testing. And it is so important and watching um, COVID absolutely ripped through the community of Sogging Shores recently and it's still ongoing. I have heard from so many people that they would not wish it on anyone that we really need to be focused on trying to keep as many of our staff and students from contracting as possible and a large part of that um, comes down to reducing the chance of vectoring illness and so many of these um so many of these measures have to do with not only keeping individuals safe but empowering them to avoid vectoring if they are in fact covid positive positive. and so i want to say that i think it is really important that we do write this letter um yeah and I'm sure in our school update, we will be talking about more specific procedural things that are happening. So at this exact moment, I will just say, I think it is really important that we write this letter. And especially I wanna, I wanna put a bit of emphasis on the local public health aspect about um, encouraging the reporting of cases in our school from the health unit as I know many, many people who daily check the report from the health unit to try and have a better idea of what's going on in the community as a whole of Grey Bruce and also in in their local more specific communities. Um, yeah, so I really, I really feel all these pieces are very important as a parent, as a community member and as a trustee who has been listening to the dialogue of everyone around so thank you trustee dawson thank you chair thompson uh, um this virus is not going away in the short term or the long term it's going to be the best case scenario as i said is it would be an endemic kind of virus mm -hmm. and for that reason i the big thing I really like out of what Trustee Johnson is saying is adding the vaccine to the student record because uh, those other diseases, they, they're they still with us and they've been around forever and ever and ever. And this one's going to be around forever as well. So I think that's a very, very important thing to include. And I'd like to thank you for that. Also, your reference to the Education Act, it's there that uh, we need to do these things. So, unless, you know, the Act takes precedence in my mind. So. The act alone speaks to what we need to be doing. So thank you for this, Trustee Johnstone, and I support it wholeheartedly. Thank you. Trustee Morgan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a cu couple of things I'd like to say. I agree 100% with um, Trustee Dawson about immun immunization. Uh, I think one of the classic ones in my lifetime and in Trustee Dawson's lifetime is polio and certainly smallpox. They've been eliminated as far in Canada, North America, let's say it that way. So those are, those are very important. Um, I was in Elm Sound today, tootling around the neighborhood. And as far as masks are concerned, I think we have to do more education with our little darlings. The uh, There were kids sauntering around, it was lunchtime, arm in arm or arm over arm, no masks, faces two feet apart. And I know they were outside, but, but still, it's still a contagious disease. I went by a primary school and the kids were all playing King of the Castle and having a wonderful time, which kids, need at this time. There's no doubt about that. They need play. They need to be with each other. But we all know that primary kids are classic for hugging and patting each other in, in whatever way they can. Um, I, 
the other thing I feel very strongly about is I think that at this time, the provincial government is trying very hard, excuse me, to get their shit together. It's, it's, it's a, it's a nightmare, but they're working day by day to deal with something that no one has had to deal with ever before. And we've never had to look at these kinds of um, deaths being recorded, children being ill. It's all horrifying for all of us, and certainly for the people who are running the government and trying, I'm sure they're trying to do their best. We, we all see faults in different parties and different ways that things are being run, but I'm sure that they, everyone, all parties aside, have got people's interests at heart. Um, so I'm not sure that writing another letter is not just going to be round filed and ignored because they are trying their best. Thank you very much. Do any other trustees have a question or comment? I just make sure no one else is mm -hmm. and then I'll come back to you. I don't see anybody else. So last call, if you have something you want to say. <laughs> felt like we just were at a bar there, uh, I know. Chair Thompson. <laughs> um, I just wanted to. Uh, OK, um, I'm just looking for what I'm looking for here. Sorry about that. I was going to scroll up. I also wanted to say, you know, say this, and I, I'm glad that Trustee uh, Morgan brought up the, the whole thing about the masking and, and concerns about students in, in masking. And I, I wanted to send you, um, I, I did send you as, as part of some of the additional documents um, and it had to do with the different kinds of masks. And the N95 non-fit mask is actually a really lightweight mask. I, I, I have actually um, um, a few of those, ma uh, those masks. And I've, I've actually found it a mask of, of choice because it stays on my, my face. It's, it's uh, quite breathable. It's better, you know, it's, it's really uh, just a much um, better fitting mask. But what I found that was interesting was um, was very much that they were looking at different kinds of you know uh, testing capabilities of these masks and and just the different um, levels of protection between them. And so um, so one is if you know if you if you if you're to refer to that particular chart that I sent and say that you were a person not infected uh, but you were wearing say a non-fit tested N95 mask and um, just say the people around you whether you know say students or other staff were also um, wearing the same ma uh, the same mask that it really increases protection to 25 hours and if and that that's where you get to see the the side part of that so when they looked at for example if i was a person who was it had it was infected i might not be aware i'm just st starting to show the signs but i had a surgical mask on um then it, it, but the other person had the n95 on, n95 on is that the in terms of the protection um, reduces greatly to just five hours. And I realize very much um, that uh, that school is much longer than five hours. Remember that kids are getting on buses. Um, and so there's a whole bus trip, there's a bus trip home, there's a, um, in being in school and that, and I just, um, and then that was why I, I really recommended that. And the reason why I recommend it in terms of testing is we have no control. I'm going to say this. I, I really tried to be, you know, change as the target was changing, being realistic. And the realistic part is, is that we can request that the public health continue to um, and test, but they are a different um, government body. We have no authority over them. So all we can do is ask that, but we do have control what, you know, we report from our classroom, which is why, you know, if um, and other boards are looking at this too and, and going there is that if, you know, 
uh, guardians or parents are phoning in and the suspicion is that, you know, that, that their child has COVID and that's why they are going to be away is to, even though it's not a perfect science and, it, and you know, or anything like that, we could say that there's these number of suspected cases. So that's about building public confidence and being transparent with our parents and our students and of course our staff. And I just want to thank you very much. And I really hope that you support um, my motion before you this evening. So thank you. Um, Trustee Lutz, we did a second call for people to talk and uh, Trustee John Stone had the last word on this one today. So um, I'm going to, I am going to put this to a vote. Um, so if uh, everyone is okay with it, I'm going to say that it was moved by Trustee Johnstone and seconded by Trustee Dawson, but I am not going to repeat the entire motion if everyone is comfortable with that. I think you've seen it and heard it. So all in favor? And opposed, if everyone can put their hands down, just so we have a sense if anyone's opposed. Trustee Morgan, your hand's still up. Is there anyone opposed? I see none, that is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, I really appreciate it. So we have a second motion tonight and we'll do the same. Uh, we have actually, this one's broken into two parts. Um, so I will uh, let Vice Chair Johnstone uh, bring this motion to us. Okay, just a minute here. Just so I can close some different screens behind me because I get lost. <laughs> so <laughs> there you, you go. Um, when you get to the be it resolved, do you want me to put the motion on the floor because I have it where it's split in two? Um, it should be the same thing that, you know, uh, this be it resolved and it should be the same. So it, I'll okay. just cut it off. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So this has to do with, you know, I just called it medical mass for Blue Water District School Board students. So whereas provincial reporting shows that schools and especially elementary schools account for the bulk of the COVID-19 outbreaks in Ontario, and this is becoming more apparent with Omicron. And whereas the vast majority of Blue Water District School Board students are only partially vaccinated or not yet eligible to be vaccinated, and whereas a tightly fitting mask has been identified by public health officials as one of the top lines of protection against COVID-19, and whereas Public Health Agency of Canada has stated for both children and adults that while non-medical masks can help prevent the spread of COVID-19, medical masks such as the non-fit tested N95 masks provide much better protection. Whereas the ministry provides medical masks for Ontario's education staff free of charge under the workplace health and safety requirements and where the ministry rec recently recognized the need for enhanced masking in schools and is now provisioning masks free of charge to all education staff. And whereas the same workplace health and safety protections offered for education staff also need to be extended to students who are required by law to attend school and whereas masking needs to be considered through an equity lens as affordability and availability of pediatric and adult medical masks is a significant barrier for many families further many families who cannot afford enhanced masking also do not have the financial privilege of choosing online learning so therefore be it resolved that the blue water district school board write a letter to the ministry of education requesting that medical masks such as non-fit tested N95 masks be fully funded and provided to every student in the province in a way that non-fitted N95 are being fully funded and provided to education staff and I will move that. Could I have a seconder please? I see Trustee Lutz and go ahead Trustee Johnstone. 
Oh, and thank you very much. And although, I mean, the reality is, is that we just already, you know, passed a motion that we, you know, has to do with um, also in, in terms of uh, supporting uh, non-fit N95 masks for students. This has to really do, to do with the first part of the motion is, is writing the ministry and asking them very much that they would also pay for this. Um, I, I um, actually um, originally way back in the beginning of January saw where the um, Ontario uh, Student Trustee Association were very much advocating that not only the that you know that um, non-fit N95 masks be provided to the student population that was from their provincial body um, but also that it be paid for by the ministry and if we have student trustees it, it would be great if we heard from them and concerning this particular motion because it was really um, um, I, I wrote this and I did share it with them before I sent it to the board um, to get their ideas and whether they supported it so thank you. So same process, you'll have two opportunities to speak and Trustee Johnstone will have the last opportunity. Um, so anybody have any comments or questions? Trustee Lutz. Sorry, so many buttons. Um, just one quick thing that I wanna make sure is made clear if we do this and also um, just make clear in the conversation is that provision needs to be for an a minimum of one N95 per day per student and for most students that it would actually likely be more like two per day as they do get wet and or um, soiled throughout the day. So I just think it's really important that um, we acknowledge the scope of what this actually is. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Any other questions or comments? Trust the Atkinson. Yes, it, it's just the the number ratio for staff and students. Um, and this comes into my nursing background. As soon as you take one off, you are technically to put that into the garbage and have a fresh one. Why no? A surgical mask? Yes. Um, that's what I've always been told. So I'm I'm just not sure the ratio piece of it and and the availability is a concern for me. Um, I, I have been able to see uh, the N95 masks with some staff and and um, some have they don't care for them. Um, and so um, I guess the availability and the ratio per mask is is a concern of mine and uh, that's all I have to say. May I respond to that? Go ahead. Um, so these are non-fit uh, N95s as opposed to the ones um, that are fitted um, and that we use in, 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 in healthcare because I, I worked in, in healthcare like you, you uh, Trustee Atkinson. They're non-fitted and actually um, they, they are um, a washable. So, but I agree, you know, we can get in the semantics that they would talk about that, you know, students would need to, but I think what, I, uh, what I'm really saying here is that we're asking that um, the ministry consider this and that they pay for it. So that's a, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a, a part that, uh, it, that we would, um, that it would be up to the ministry if they're recommending it for you know staff that they would recommend it for students and we've already said that we're writing a letter asking for exactly that in our previous motion. Trustee Morgan. Thank you chair. Um, would just like to say 
that um, yes, um, the ministry is paying for it, but we must all remember that we're paying for it. It comes out of our pocket, the taxes that we pay. Thank you. Any other further commentary on this? Trustee Lutz, go ahead. So, sorry, no. OK. So it looks like we're ready to call this one to a question. Trustee Johnston, go ahead. Thank you. Just uh, like to um, talk about it. I, I agree with uh, Trustee Morgan that, you know, at the end of the day, um, we we all we all pay for this. And I and um, and so I'm quite aware of that. At the same time, it, it's an equity issue. Where I already know that um, families who can are, are already going out and buying uh, their children, students, um, non fit and 95 masks. Um, I uh, so I, I've already seen that it's a, it really is an an equity concern and also it's a safety concern and, and it's about ensuring that we provide within our school system um, the you know the highest protection so that we can also keep our schools open and I think that's the other piece is that we want to provide a safe learning and working environment so we want the highest protection um, for our our, our uh, children and particularly for our students who aren't vaccinated um, or they're immune compromised or they have family members that do um, that um, that or they only have uh, one 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 shot they are not even close to you know being fully vaccinated yet and um, and that's what it is so it's a right about writing a, a letter and and um, it's not actually at this point you know outside Side of you know an advocacy and it's really coming from the Ontario Student um, uh, Student Association Trustee Association of Ontario. Thank you. So we're ready to call this first uh, motion to question. It was moved by Trustee John Stone, seconded by Trustee Lutz, and it's that the Blue Water District School Board write a letter to the Ministry of Education requesting that medical masks such as non-fit tested N95 masks be fully funded and provided to every student in the province in the same way that rest or I'm on the wrong motion sorry Jen the same way that non-fit tested N95s are being fully funded and provided to education staff all in favor And that is carried. Thank you so very much. So we have one more motion to talk about tonight and go ahead, Trustee Johnston. So I'm not obviously going to do all those whereases. So I'm just going to go right to the resolution because it was originally um, a part of the you know whole resolution. And that is that at the Blue Water District School Board prepare a report on the cost of of provisioning every Blue Water District School Board student with a non-fit tested N95 mask for the remainder of the year and the feasibility of applying COVID-19 related funds to pay for masks to ensure that both students and staff are provisioned equally with PPE needed to safely learn and work. And I will move that. And a seconder. Trustee Lutz. Go ahead, Trustee Johnstone. Thank you very much. So obviously, you know, if if the um the, the, the ministry doesn't step up and provide that, and we saw that actually happen earlier um last year when we, when we were actually using some of our funds to in school, you know, ensure you know, school safety, we we're going beyond and above. We've already done that with, um, you know, portable HEPA filters and stuff. Is let's uh, let's actually see what the cost is of this and that um, if it's doable, then it would be a cost consideration for us to use some of our COVID funds for. But unless we know what the cost is, we're, we don't know what we're talking about. Trustee 
trustees have questions or comments? Trustee Lutz. Thank you. I think it is a great idea to take it upon ourselves if this is something we feel is important and valuable to see the feasibility of doing in the absence of the government doing it and as part of that to continue from our conversation from the last motion i would like to suggest that part of this report include um the number needed for per individual for standard usage and also until mentioned by trustee johnstone i had never heard of an n95 that was washable so this was something new to me so i would be curious if we are getting washable ones the lifespan um like so how many would still be needed and also um Oh, sorry, I completely lost track of what I was saying. Basically, just to go back to um, the, the numbers, the numbers required um, practical usage be a part of that. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Anybody else have anything to add to this? Trustee Johnstone, did you want to add anything else? I think I've said a lot. <laughs> so I leave it to the will of the board. All right. So it was moved by Trustee Johnstone, seconded by Trustee Lutz, that the Blue Water District School Board prepare a report on the cost of provisioning every Blue Water District School Board student with a non-fit tested N95 mask for the remainder of the year and the feasibility of applying COVID-19 related funds to pay for masks to ensure that both students and staff are provisioned equally and pre-needed with the pre-needed uh, to safely learn and work. All in favor. I see uh, four in favor, any opposed? I will get rid of those. Any opposed? So that is carried. I don't see any opposed. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. And your students and staff also appreciate it, I'm sure. Um, trustees have been provided with a report with the uh, committees with trustee representation on them. Um, it's for your uh, review and participation. Thank you. We took your uh, suggestions and did our best, um, uh, Vice Chair Johnstone and myself, to uh, try and place everyone uh, appropriately. So I'll be looking for a mover and a seconder uh, that the Blue Water District School Board receive the committees with trustee representation report for information. Could I have a mover, please? Uh, Trustee Atkinson and seconded by Trustee Johnstone. All in favor? Thank you, that's carried. So we're to our reports uh, for information. And first I'd like to invite student trustee uh, Gabe Rossiter to present the student senate report for us. Hey everybody, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? We're good, Perfect. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Thompson. Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to present the Senate report tonight. 
During the last few weeks, we have encountered many changes regarding school. Yesterday, we returned to learning in person. Students feel happy to be back in class and with their peers, but there is still a small amount of concern as COVID cases have escalated in our area and throughout the province. At the end of the day, the return to in-person learning is critical to students' mental health and motivation. Students in the Blue Water High Schools have also been informed that semester one example exams have been canceled. Students will have the opportunity to demonstrate their learning with culminating assignments. Students have been happy to hear the news as it takes some pressure off during these uncertain times. Students are excited to begin semester two with hopes that cases of COVID-19 will reduce to allow for a loosening of restrictions as they miss their extracurricular activities. The Student Senate has been busy preparing for senator elections in their high school. Many senators have created posters or promotional materials which have sparked some interest in their peers for possible candidates. Elections will be held in February and the incumbent senator will be submitted by February 25th. During our meeting on January 4th, our Senate welcomed Crystal Miles from the Director's Office. She attended the meeting to speak about policies and procedures and the role the Student Senate can play in its policy review. It was a pleasure having Crystal and we thank her for sharing her expertise. Our Senate has continued to work through hard times and these unprecedented times and has been amazing to work with. So I just wanna say thank you to the, all the Student Senate and to Cheryl Elliott for making this experience awesome through all these uh, unprecedented times. Thank you so much for listening. I am pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gabe. Do trustees have any questions? I see Trustee Dawson. I saw Trustee Dawson. Thank you, Chair Thompson. Not a question, just a comment. Gabe, I always appreciate your upbeat, positive reports. You bring the life to the Student Center report. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Jim. Trustee Lutz. As I also just wanted to say a big thank you for the report. It is always great to hear um, from our student senate and what's going on in in our schools. And I want to wish you all well with your nor normally we'd say exams this time of year. So I guess I need to um, ch change course and say um, with your cumulative assignments and I, I hope they are not too stressful for you and that they're all going well. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see no other questions or comments. Thank you very much, Gabe. Staff reports. I'd like to invite Superintendent of Education uh, Elliot to speak to this report, and I'll be looking for a mover and a seconder to put the report on the table that the Blue Water District School Board received the hearing services report for information. Could I have a mover, please? Trustee McComb and a seconder. Trustee Miller. And welcome, uh, Superintendent Elliott. Thank you very much, Chair Thompson. I am pleased to welcome Melissa McEwen, uh, Learning Services Administrator, and Tori Wilkin, Teacher of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Tori recently shared her expertise with the SEAC committee, and we felt that it was appropriate for you to hear the difference our hearing services department uh, is making for our students in Blue Water. So I welcome Melissa McEwen and Tori Wilkin to uh, present to you tonight. Thank you, Superintendent Elliott. Chair Thompson and trustees, thank you very much for providing us with this opportunity to share information about Blue Water District School Board Learning Services student support. Specifically, Tori Wilkin, teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing, is joining us this evening to present a summary of the impact of hearing loss on students and an overview of the supports, programming, and technology provided by Blue Water District School Board for students who are experiencing a hearing loss. Tori is a member of a larger team the hearing support team consists of several additional professionals, including a board contracted audiologist, three communicative disorders assistants, and one office professional. All are committed to providing a responsive collaborative service that meets the needs of students with hearing loss. At this time, I will turn things over to Tori. Thank you, Melissa. Good evening, everybody. 
Um, thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to just project a presentation to share with you. If you can just give me a second. So as Melissa mentioned, uh, my name is Tori Wilkin and I am the itinerant teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing for the Blue Water District School Board. Itinerant means that I don't have a classroom. What I do is travel from school to school throughout the board and meet the varying needs of our deaf and hard of hearing students in their home schools and support the school staff. Melissa, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my presentation? Thank you. OK, um, I'm hoping my quick presentation tonight will provide you with information about hearing loss and how it impacts students, outline the different roles and responsibilities in our hearing service department and give you some information on the, spe on the specialized hearing equipment used by students with hearing loss in the Blue Water District School Board. So to start off, it is important to have a bit of background on hearing loss in order to understand why these students need support. So every student's hearing loss is different. Hearing loss can vary in degree. It can be mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe or profound. Hearing loss can vary in type. It can be conductive, sensory neural or mixed. And hearing loss can be temporary, fluctuating or permanent for our students. Depending on their loss, some students with hearing loss have personal equipment that they wear outside of school, like cochlear implants shown in the picture uh, here, or hearing aids. While other students do, or sorry, while other students do not wear any equipment outside of school, but all of them are listening through damaged a damaged auditory system, which can impact their access to speech or language and result in them struggling to access information in the classroom. So each student with hearing loss is different, but even with technology, none of them are getting the full picture. So usually when I present, I like to let people experience what it's like to have a hearing loss. With us being online and not being able to have you put in earplugs or listen to sound through hearing aids, I'm hoping this activity will, uh, as well as some YouTube clips, will give you an idea of what it is like to have a hearing loss and illustrate why some of these students need additional supports. On this slide, there is an example of what you would hear if you had a mild hearing loss. I've removed the sounds that you wouldn't hear, but I've made it much easier for you because I've put it in print. If you were in the classroom and this story was read aloud by the teacher, it would vanish afterwards, making it more challenging to piece together. I'd like you to figure out what sounds are missing and read this story so you understand it and can answer some questions. So I'm going to give you a minute with the story and if anyone would like to turn on their mic once they've figured out parts of the story or would like to attempt to read it, feel free to go ahead and turn your mic on. Now that you've had a bit of time with it, let's see if you can answer some questions. Again, feel free to turn on your mics or type responses in the chat. Maybe Cheryl or Melissa, you could watch the chat for me for responses. So our first question is, what season is it in the story? No takers. Um, does it help to have a picture to figure out what Wait season it is? I'm Jan Johnstone. I can, I think I would like to respond to that. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, just to let you know, we can't actually use our chat function. Okay. Yeah. 
So Thank it's you. been turned off. So just to let you know that I thought January. You thought January. OK, <laughs> it was fall. <laughs> I, it's the autumn. Yes. Yes. Yeah. OK, so. Leaves. Our next question is who likes to hide in the leaves? I do. <laughs> in the story. <laughs> Tori, it looks like Jim has an answer. Yeah. Okay, Jim. I don't have an answer. Maybe it's my hearing loss. I couldn't hear anything in the story. <laughs> in this story, Max likes to hide in the leaves. Does anyone know what Bill likes to do or Billy likes to do? He likes to make big piles of leaves. And my last question for you guys is what does Jane like? And in this story, Jane actually likes the colors, the pretty colors of the leaves. So I suspect if I had, if we had a lot of time tonight, you could eventually figure this story out. Um, but this is what the story would sound like or would look like for someone who didn't have a mild hearing loss. So everyone else in the class would hear this story, but the student with mild hearing loss would hear what you had seen on the previous slide. So some things to think about. Did you have full access to the information you needed to complete this activity? Obviously not. Having just a mild hearing loss puts you at a substantial disadvantage compared to others at completing this activity. Another thing I'd like you to think about is what strategies you tried to use to try to figure out what the words were. Um, it's important to note though that students don't have the same awareness or repair strategies as adults. You knew all the vocabulary in that story once you got to see it. So um, you also had it in print. Um, so you could sort of start to substitute some sounds and try to create some words. But imagine how much harder it would be if it was new information or new vocabulary that you were trying to learn in the classroom. Students who are deaf can't fill in the blanks because they can't guess as well as adults can. And often they don't know what they're missing. They just don't hear what's not there uh, because they don't hear it. The next thing I'd like you to think about is how much time did it take? I couldn't give you as much time as um, it probably would have taken to do this activity, but obviously it took longer or was taking you longer than it would have if you had full access. So often students with hearing loss require more time. They require repetition of information, extra time to process and clarification of information. The next thing I'd like you to think about is how important the visual information was to the speed, speed and your success. Uh, I'm certain having that picture and the questions in print helped you try to piece together a few things in the story. You at least knew who the characters were once you saw the questions. And when you had the picture with the kids in the leaves, you knew that it was fall, so you could answer one of those questions. Providing visual information is essential, essential to success. Things like closed captioning, instructions in print, and lesson notes are really important for our students. And the last thing I want you to think about is what might a student's behavior look like in this situation? Often students with hearing loss appear to be slower to complete work or slower to start because they're watching others to figure out what they need to do. They seem distracted and unable to focus at times and they may even act out or seem anxious. Remember that when we did this task, I did not change your intellectual ability, but I took away access to information that everyone else had. So we need to ensure in the classroom that we're providing access. So um, on our next slide here, the, um, if I have a good optometrist, my glasses allow me to see just like any person without glasses that has 20-20 vision. But hearing aids and cochlear implants do not work this way. I'm going to play a clip for you now that will give you an idea of what it sounds like to hear through a cochlear implant. And hopefully we won't have to listen to any advertisements, but I had my stuff I write long essays a little that while I ago. Work on for days, <laughs> but now I'm writing. Hi, 
And now I'm going to play a clip for you to show you what it sounds like to listen in a classroom with a hearing aid. Um, they're going to demonstrate for you the impacts of distance and noise in this clip and show you how having a personal FM or a DM system can improve the listening environment for students with hearing loss. So as you can see, despite how amazing technology is, hearing through hearing aids and cochlear implants does not sound the same as normal hearing. Um, and it's quite challenging to listen in noise, uh, in noisy environments or to people that are more than three feet away when you have hearing aids. The last impact I wanted to mention is listening bubbles. For most children, language is caught, not taught. Most kids magically acquire their first language because they have access to it. They learn new words by overhearing them. But children with hearing loss have a listening bubble and the size of it depends on the degree of hearing loss and the use of technology. And children with hearing loss are at a disadvantage in learning language because they do not catch the same amount of language as others. So over time, for some, this can lead to significant language delays and social delays, which again is why some of these students need to be purpose purposefully exposed to and taught language through direct support. I'd like to talk to you now a bit about our hearing services team and the supports that we work together to, to provide. So Mark Newcomb is our educational audiologist. He interprets audiology reports. He recommends new ministry funded specialized hearing equipment for students. He also visits schools to set up and verify new equipment and he consults with clinical audiologists, families, schools and students on their needs. Our communicative disorder assistants Pam Newcomb and Crystal Stoby are unique because they also belong to the board's specialized technology department. But for the hearing services department, they provide training to staff on sound field systems. They do system checks to ensure hearing equipment is functioning properly. They maintain a board wide inventory for all the specialized hearing equipment and they provide troubleshooting and uh, repairs for systems in the board. Our part time communicative disorder assistant uh, hearing, Brianna Cook, provides one-to-one -one therapy for speech receptive expressive language, listening comprehension, and literacy under my supervision, and she helps create alternative materials for students with hearing loss in various schools throughout the board. Our learning services assistant, Joan Farrow, connects with equipment providers like Phonak and Oticon, and she orders and receives equipment for us. And she also maintains student specialized equipment amount files at the board office. And in my role, I act as the lead of our department and maintain a number of inventories and databases. I provide students with one-to-one -one withdraw instruction in receptive expressive language, listening comprehension and literacy, and I set alternative goals and complete alternative progress reports for those students. I also work with students one-to-one -to, -one to help them develop self-advocacy skills like learning to monitor and troubleshoot their own hearing equipment. Um, I provide in-services and training to school teams and do presentations in classrooms on hearing loss, technology and accommodations. I interpret audiology reports and I assist in developing students individual education plans and transition plans. I troubleshoot and repair personal DM equipment and I monitor the academic progress of students not receiving withdrawal support. So together we work to support a total of 118 students in the moment um, with hearing loss in the Blue Water District School Board. 58 students have personal hearing aids and cochlear implants and are supported with personal DM systems in our schools. And 39 students have sound field systems. 
Some of our high school students have up to three systems to support different classrooms that they might be in throughout their schedule and their day. And we have currently 21 students with hearing loss that have no technology. We also support in the board an additional 27 students diagnosed with central auditory processing disorder that also have sound field systems in their classrooms. So when we talk about a personal DM system, this is a system that transmits the teacher's voice directly to the student's hearing aids or cochlear implants. As you recall from the video, it allows the student to hear when the teacher is far away and it amplifies the teacher's voice above the background noise. A sound field system transmits the teacher's voice over a speaker for all students in the class to hear, including the student with mild hearing loss. So you can see pictures of those two in this slide. And now you can hear about the equipment from one of our experts in the board. This video is one of our students and he's gonna to talk to you a bit about his cochlear implants, how they have a magnet on them that holds them to his head and how they help him hear by getting information to his brain. He talks a bit about the rechargeable batteries that they have and how he's waiting for new parts to help his equipment work better. Um, he is also going to tell you about his mic or his personal DM that his teacher wears that brings the teacher's voice close and above the noise in the classroom. And just so you know, when we did the videotaping of this, um, we had social distancing practices in place. So I'll play that video for you now. Hi, it is me, Chris, and welcome back to my video. Today, I'm gonna tell you how my popular and place works. So first, they have in my name, and that's connected to my brain. And it's making my inside my brain and it helps me hear. And the rest of this does and this battery and there's the battery and style uh, and I can show you. It's quite small, but it has power of my battery. And I get and I be getting a new part to soon. And I gonna show you how the straps I mean how the mic works. First they connect to my implants and here's what the screen looks like. It has a three different stretches. This one helps me here. Let me just go. It connects. So, so they, and it gets connected, and the mic gets, and someone speaks into the mic, I hear it. And they say there is sensitivity to noise, so the mic can get very noisy. It gets like five times more noise here. And I said one one, but the mic that I don't like. But in the way, in the strap and this, if someone wears it, and they take the part, and you can put them together, and that's how it works. And teachers wear it, and especially Tori. Come. What else does Tori do when she comes to you? She helps me speak and listen and other stuff and this and read and we get to do things. Now, bye. Like I said, he's an expert. He wants to be a YouTuber someday. So this was great practice for him. Um, I think that this brings me to the end of my presentation, but I would be happy to answer questions if there are any questions. Hi. Oops, it's going to play. There we go. Go ahead, Trusty Dawson. Well, thank you. That uh, video was certainly enlightening. I don't know if you caught it. When he took his mask off, his hearing aid got caught in the mask. And that's something that I've experienced, and I'm sure other people with hearing aids have as well. And uh, if anybody has any ideas of how I can put my mask on and not get it caught in the hearing aid, I'd be open to that suggestion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great presentation. Trustee Lutz.
Thank you. Thank you so much for the fantastic and very informative presentation. And I just want to say that I was in a school recently and got to see firsthand not only the system in action, but a student advocating for um, best use of the personal auditory system. I forget if it's an FM or DM, I'm going to confuse that. But I just want to say that your work helping students to advocate for themselves is paying off and I've seen it in action and you can be really proud of all all of the students in the program because they are they are working so hard and it is very clear and just quick to trustee um, Dawson there are certain masks that loop behind your head rather than around your ear that might help with the um, hearing aid problem. But anyways, back on point and thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you so much. Trustee Johnstone. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I, I am a person who has audio processing. Identif I'm identified as a person with audio processing problems. And also I had two children and they're adult, young female adults now that also have audio processing problems. And um, so I was really interested in what was going on in school. So I, I noticed that you identified, you know, certain students that didn't have any tech, weren't using any technology, but very much how um, schools teach children, uh, particularly say with audio processing. And I'm sure it's for other uh, students who um, um, are have, are you know have um auditory problems that they have to also learn very, very much how to advocate for themselves because you never know what you're missing <laughs> you know i you know did, did you hear that no i i did but you don't even know you missed information so thank you very much and it was a great, great presentation thank you for all you do thank you trustee atkinson hi tori i just want to thank you for bringing a piece of seat to the the Board of Trustees um, and to today I seen some advocacy with a little friend that you will know who I'm talking on and it was wonderful to see it almost brought tears to my eyes it was just a wonderful moment and um, I've been able to see the work that Tori's done with a young student from for a few years now and it's as different as day and night she does a fabulous job she has a wonderful team and when she comes into the school she's bubbly and smiling and she's a, a pleasure to just say hello to in the morning so thank you tori for your all your work and to all your your um colleagues you're doing a fantastic job Keep thank you so much. Good Make me, you're making me emotional. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I, I could get like that too, but I really do appreciate all you do, Tori. And it's really nice that I get to see firsthand what you actually do and uh, the accomplishments and milestones that you have accomplished. It's it's a pleasure to report back to this board of all the fine things that uh, you and, and the other parts of this team do. So thank you for sharing your wonderful presentation. And I just want a quick question. Has Chris made any more YouTube videos? <laughs> if, if he has, they're all on Minecraft craft and Roblox, all on <laughs> Roblox. We did a speech on Roblox this week when I worked with him. I knew nothing about Roblox and now I know a three minute speech on them. So well, they're probably on gaming things. <laughs> thank you, Tori. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, Melissa, for joining as well. Uh, Tori, I, I do have one question. In this day and age of us all wearing masks, I'm curious. I watch just as I walk around town and as a person who I think I hear fine, uh, have a sometimes more of a struggle to understand what someone is saying. And I wonder how these students are impacted with mask wearing. Yeah, I mean, I think each student's experience is different. We definitely have some students who were anxious about returning to school with masks and opted to do things like our remote or online learning or through ILCs because they were um, not necessarily worried about 
missing the content from the teacher because they felt that the systems that the teacher would wear would be beneficial, but they were worried about social times with peers and not being able to understand what their classmates were saying in class or at lunchtime or on the yard when they didn't have the visual information that they were so used to having, right? So um, I think that that has played a big impact for some of our students. Um, we did trial clear masks at one point last year with students and staff um, to try to provide that visual information back again but the plastic clear mask blocked a lot of the auditory signal and when we surveyed students and teachers afterwards the students most advocated for the fact that the blue medical mask allowed a better auditory signal to come through with their personal um, system or the sound field systems so most teachers ended up going back to just using the blue medical mask because the, the kids were benefiting more from having a better auditory signal than they were from having a bit of visual information back with those clear masks. So we did have the opportunity to try some of those, but um, very few teachers continue to use it. We do have some elementary teachers or teachers who are working a lot on phonological awareness that will put them on when they're working on specific sounds with students where they can show them the shape of their lips. Um, and then they go back to using the medical masks for the rest of the day. So there's definitely been some some disadvantages to having uh, to having the masks for sure for our students, but we are trying our best by uh, making sure that the systems are all being used effectively around the board. Super, thank you. And thank you very much for the presentation. It was very, very informative. It was moved by uh, Trustee McComb and seconded by Trustee Miller that the Blue Water District School Board receive the hearing services report for information. All in favor. Thank you, that is carried. Thank you again for your time. Which brings us to our school update report. Um, Superintendent Elliott will begin us uh, tonight. So I'll be looking for a mover and a seconder that the Blue Water District School Board received the school update report for information. Uh, Trustee Lutz and a seconder, Trustee Morgan. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. It's my pleasure to begin the school update report this evening, and I'll be followed by Superintendents Cummings, Lefebvre, and Tang. I'll first uh, start to talk a little bit about uh, staffing shortages. With the increase in COVID-19 cases in our community, staffing shortages may make it necessary to close individual schools for operational reasons. We're working diligently with principals to find strategies to reorganize schools and to reorganize schedules to keep schools open whenever possible. Uh, temporary certificates will be issued as was done last year for uh, new teachers through, uh, that are still in teachers college and retired teachers may now teach for 95 days without pension impact and I'm pleased to uh, report that the first two days have gone uh, successfully with uh, of course staff shortages and having to make things work but obviously we've been able to keep the schools uh, operating and open. Absence reporting uh, the Ministry of Education requi requires schools to uh, notify public health officials when student absenteeism in a school reaches 30% from its baseline. In an effort to be proactive, we have been sharing our absenteeism data, including absences due to illness and overall absences with Graber's public health since the pandemic began. Uh, we've recently added in the calculation of percentage absence to support this. Schools are also required to report absenteeism and school closures through the Ministry of Education absence reporting tool. And this includes student and staff absences in addition to school closures. And our schools will be begin this reporting in the uh, absence reporting tool tomorrow, January 19th. And data will be publicly available for parents on Ontario.ca starting January 24th, 2022. For student vaccine clinics, we are currently investigating opportunities for in-school vaccine clinics with Graber's Public Health. And then uh, for rapid antigen tests, uh, the Ministry of Education has uh, provided two rapid tests per staff member and all in uh, elementary uh, students to be used if symptomatic. You'll recall that all students were provided with five tests prior to the holidays to take when they return. So these are additional to that and remaining supply uh, that we have currently will be for secondary students and more rapid tests will be distributed to schools as they become available. Uh, and uh, one thing we also wanted to bring to your attention is a Graber's Public Health website. 
uh, the uh, with the mention of COVID-19 cases, it's an important reminder that the Graver's Public Health has a wealth of information and data related to cases and vaccinations in our area, and we encourage you to visit this site. Uh, that's those are the things that I was reporting on tonight. If anyone wanted to ask questions or had any comment on my points before I pass on to Superintendent Cummings. Trustee Johnstone. Uh, thank you very much, Superintendent Elliott, for your part of the presentation. Um, one of the things that um, came up um, um, that was was changed after the uh, the government presentation on return to school is that 30% reporting out, but we but school boards could actually um, do something different. They could report it lower. It, you know, if we we chose to, so it's not etched in in stone, but they were actually giving you could say some authority to boards um, uh, that they could also um, report lower than that in terms of abstinence. I still struggle with using the word abstinence because we don't really know if that is related to COVID or you know they decided to take the day off and go tobogganing. Um, you know, so we don't really know um, exactly, you know, uh, why um, students and say staff are being absent when, when they just use that as a tool because it's not um, um, it's not determining enough exactly what the say the case count of, of COVID is in the in a classroom or in a school. So thank you. Uh, through, through the chair, if I could just provide some further information in the report that we share daily with public health. It does include um, symptoms, not just uh, uh, suspected COVID-19, but gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, respiratory symptoms. So if the school has that information and they input it into our student information system, it is shared daily with public health. And uh, I know that they uh, read that report quite closely because it gives them a good metric on uh, the landscape in uh, Blue Water uh, as far as, far as uh, illness is concerned. So. Thank you. Trustee Lutz. Yes, sorry, I had to sneeze. Um, so two related questions. Um, and it's about contact tracing. Since I know the public health unit is no longer doing contact tracing, I am wondering if there is any operational capacity for performing contact tracing in a similar vein to what public health was doing, because in the absence of public health led contact tracing, I, I have seen it happen where um, people become um, unofficial Sherlock Holmeses and um, do um, contact tracing by rumor and speculation, which does not protect anyone's uh, privacy. And just to go along with that, um, you know, li linking that reporting and all that to um, potential staffing shortages, will we be combining cohorts as a way to adapt for staffing shortages? And to go along with that, how will that impact potential contact tracing? And I realized that was you know, two questions jumbled together, I, but they are interrelated and intermixed. So I hope you can make sense of it. I am happy to clarify if needed. Thank you. Through the chair. So I'll tackle that uh, in two questions, uh, Trustee Lutz. So no, we don't really have the capacity uh, in the school system to become contact tracers. Um, we do have, um, you know, it's a little bit more difficult because there are no longer confirmed PCR uh, COVID-19 cases in schools. We have what we would say are probable cases or possible cases of COVID-19 in schools. Um, I, I believe the Provincial Medical Officer of Health is trying to make the shift toward the, the absenteeism data rather than uh, the contact tracing. And uh, that's why we're uh, reporting robust uh, absenteeism data. The second question about collapsing classes, we have provided the um, uh, ability for schools to collapse classes provided that they can uh, social distance between co cohorts. So if by chance they had a couple of classes with uh, high absenteeism where they maybe only had, you know, five or 10 students in one of the classes, as long as you can get 
the uh, social distance between the cohorts, yes, that is a possibility. Can I ask a follow up question? Go ahead. So just to follow up with that, if cohorts are being combined, will parents or families be notified beforehand or only after the fact if their student chooses to mention it? There wouldn't be a notification to families. We have had the ability to mix students throughout this year. For instance, uh, la last year we wouldn't have integrated st uh, students in a developmental learning group or we wouldn't have uh, withdrawn students to uh, work in a reading group. That kind of um, mixing of cohorts has been occurring in schools this year and we haven't uh, informed families uh, when that occurs. So I don't believe that it would be something that we would do if we were collapsing classes due to um, for uh, any purpose going forward. Can I just ask one question? Uh, I listened to um, a CBC phone in uh, the other day and the Dr. Uni, who is from the scientific table, was talking about the importance of doing a rapid test properly and that there was excellent information on the public health website. Is that information that has gone home with people to do their tests uh, accurately? We haven't, we, we, with each of the rapid tests, there is, there are instructions that are going home with families. As far as a, the specific source you're talking about, um, Chair Thompson, that we haven't, but if you wanted to bring that to my attention, it might be something that we could share. I do agree that uh, instructions on a piece of paper might not be as easy uh, for um, students to follow. One of the first things I did when we received our kits of five for students was to pull out the instructions and see if I could follow them fairly clearly. And I felt that with the visuals, they were um, pretty easy to follow on what, what it was that was required to do the test effectively. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? So I think that takes us to Superintendent Cummings. Thank you, Chair Thompson, and good evening again. I'm going to speak to you a little bit about the portable HEPA filtration units that are currently in all of our ministry mandated spaces in all of our Blue Water schools. Uh, plus most developmental learning classrooms where students are unable to consistently wear their masks. To date, there are 162 units in our schools. Uh, these units supplement the excellent mechanical air ventilation and filtration systems in our schools. And of course, our ventilation report is in the spotlight on our website. You can always go in there and see the updates that we make to it as we go through them. <clears throat> so the ministry has also allocated 32 additional units to Blue Water. Uh, we're expecting them to arrive in late January. These are to be deployed uh, into learning your environments and schools in a manner that maximize their benefit and minimize the overall transmission of risks. We've consulted with our administrators and our union partners to prioritize the placement of these HEPA filters when they arrive uh, as follows. Classrooms with kindergarten students, uh, this is a ministry requirement and that was completed a while ago. Similarly, classrooms where there's no mechanical ventilation systems, uh, we only have two schools, not even fully uh, partial schools. Uh, and of course, that's a ministry requirement as well and that has been completed. <clears throat> Uh, classrooms where there are students who are unable to wear a mask, such as a developmental learning classroom or even the occasional other classroom. Uh, this is beyond the ministry requirement and most of those classrooms are complete. And again, we are looking at smaller spaces uh, where possible, where staff members are required to work with students uh, who are unable to wear a mask. And of course, this is beyond what the ministry has required us to do as well. And we are looking at uh, prior, putting those into the priority level. And again, some older portables, if applicable. I think actually most of our portables are very new at this point. So, uh, but we they will be on the priority list uh, where we could possibly enhance the mechanical ventilation and filtration in those. Uh, but after I said it, I honestly can't remember, can't see a portable that we have uh, that has students in it. We have a number with storage in a storage product in it, but no students. Uh, that concludes the update on the HEPA uh, filter units. Um, be happy to pass this over to Superintendent Lefebvre. 
we'll just see if there's any questions before Certainly. we sure, let you off the hook. Yeah. Uh, Trustee Johnstone. <clears throat> Um, thank you very much for your report. Um, last night I attended a Elkin Market Home and School meeting and they were talking about the portable HEPA, HEPA filter system and how they were, you know, saying that there needed to be a lot more of them and they were also talking about the ability to fundraise um, for them. I'm just letting you know. And I have talked to um, some trustees from two other boards, Water Waterloo District School Board and Thames Valley where um, they wanted to ensure there was equity uh, across their system, and so they they devised a way to be able to do um, fundraising for approved HEPA filters, portable filters that would support their schools and ensure that they're going into the right places beyond what is you know, not only provided for the board. And um, just to let you know, I'll be um, I have talked to um, Chair Thompson about it and Director Wilder about it and looking down the road um, in the very near future to maybe put a motion before the board uh, concerning that. Um, and just to let you know that I heard last night at Elgin Market that their portable doesn't have a HEPA filter. So, you know, so I don't know, um, but that's what I was told, so. Anyway, thank you very much. Superintendent Cummings, did you want to respond or? Uh, through the chair, just a brief comment. So the priority list that I gave you does not mean that we've actually got uh, units in all those places. That's the list that we're looking at as the new 32 come in. Uh, there's some other spaces that we still need to get to uh, above the portables. Uh, portables have a unit vent uh, installed in all of them actually that, that works rather well, better than non-mechanical for sure. So, but yeah, we'll definitely take that under advisement. And, and thank you and thank you for all you do and thank you for listening to staff in terms of their recommendations about where they should go. Trustee Atkinson. Thank you, Chair Thompson. I just have a question, Robin. I don't know if you can answer this right now, and it's not fair of me to ask, but the univents that are in the classrooms in some of our schools, are they equivalent to a HEPA filter? Through the chair, you're correct. I cannot answer that right now, but I can come back to you. Yeah, that's fine. And and it just popped in my mind. I, I had a little tour this, this morning, and I, I um, seen what the HEPA filters look like, and I was I, I know that some of the classrooms have the univent, so I was just curious and I, I should have sent you an email earlier and I do apologize for that, but I'm in no hurry to to um, have an answer. I'm just curious more than anything. Uh, through the chair, may I ask uh, which school and classroom so I can get a better picture? Oh, Spruce Ridge, sorry. Thank you. Spruce Ridge, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Uh, uh, we'll welcome Superintendent Lefebvre and just a heads up for everybody. If we're going beyond 930, we'll need a motion to extend our meeting. So uh, we'll have another presentation and see where we're at after that. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, the exams for semester one classes, um, as uh, the student uh, Senate report indicated earlier, Gabe stole my thunder. Uh, given the situation with COVID-19 and the Omicron vir variant and our transition to remote learning following the holiday break, we have opted to cancel formal exams for secondary semester one classes. Uh, teachers have been encouraged to use these days for credit rescue purposes to help students complete outstanding assessments, culminating tasks and summative projects. On another note, extracurricular activities and sports. Uh, we have made the decision uh, to put a pause on sports, extracurricular activities and field trips until January 26th. Um, and we will also be pausing uh, indoor high contact and high intensity activities such as multi cohort choirs and instrument uh, ensembles until further direction from the ministry. And our planning for semester two, um, as I had talked about in an earlier school uh, update report, um, we have been previously approved um, from uh, Grey Bruce Public Health to move ahead with a full semester system, moving from the modified to a full semester system. We have not made the decision yet to move in that direction because the ministry has indicated um, uh, that we need to check in once again with Grey Bruce Public Health, which we will be doing in the very near future. 
And that's it for my report. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. And if not, I can pass it along um, to Superintendent Tang. I see Trustee Lutz and Trustee Miller. Thank you very much for that report. Um, I just wanted to say about the planning for semester two, I don't know if there are communications going out formally through schools or not, but I have had concerned communications from parents about um, what semester two will look like. Uh, and so I would just, I, I would like to encourage communication to parents and families that is formal, even if it is in the vein of, we don't know yet, we are continuing to assess the situation. I just know there is a high anxiety level um, related to that and anything we can do to mitigate anxiety right now, I know is greatly appreciated. So thank you very much. And I appreciate hearing about what's being done in our um, secondary schools to um, increase um, safety and mitigate transmission. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Miller. Hi, thank you. I, I sort of have similar sentiments to Trustee Lutz in so far that I too have been getting inquiries from caregivers that are quite concerned about the format. And I realize that uh, we need to check in with public health on uh, whether we go with plan A or plan B, but can you let me know what it is specifically that criteria is from public health? Are they looking at a threshold case? Can, like, what is it that will be the determining factor to decide whether we go with option A or option B? I am not one that has attended those meetings with public health, and I'm not sure if we would be able to speak on their behalf with respect to what they're looking at um, in terms of that threshold. Uh, perhaps Director Wilder has a response. Through the chair, um, the ministry has given all boards approval to move forward with the semester system, and it was just the suggestion, just check in again with your public health units. Uh, myself and the uh, director from the Bruce Gray Catholic District School Board met with Dr. Era previously, and uh, there weren't necessarily metrics. He just felt very comfortable that we could move towards this. So the idea is we just check in again. Um, and so we will do that. And just once we get the OK, um, it's the ministry is um, supporting boards and moving forward with going to the semester system. Trustee Miller, did you have a follow up? I did. Thank you, Chair. So um, if that's the case, it sounds like for all intents and purposes, we are moving forward. Um, can we sort of expedite that check in that final check in with public health so that we can let families and caregivers and post secondary students that have a lot of um, change and flux seems to be thrown at them at the 11th hour. If we have an opportunity to give them a little bit more notice about this instead of waiting until we have to, maybe we sort of share that so that uh, they can plan. Is that an option? Through the chair, absolutely we can. In fact, I, at this point in time, I think families, the communication that had gone out to them previously was that second semester would be a full semester system. Uh, we haven't changed that messaging. Uh, it was just came through the ministry around that we could do this and you should check in again. So we will do that. Our um, when the senior team met to discuss this, it was very much that we just needed to get up and running this week with us returning to face to face before we checked in on this, see how things are going. So that uh, will be something that will be done um, hopefully by the end of this week. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Superintendent Tang. Through the chair, good evening. I'm here to bring you an update about staff vaccinations. So we were um, fortunate in Gray Bruce, the Gray Bruce Public Health stated that um, any um, residents who wish to get their booster shot would be able to get an appointment before January 21st. And there were lots and lots of clinics offered and we made sure to share all of those clinics with them. Um, all of our staff members and many of the clinics also included evening hours um, for people that were working 
during the day. Um, at this time, 95% of our permanent staff are fully vaccinated. Um, we have had um, notification from the ministry that they would they are going to collect information about how many people have received their booster shot, but they have not changed the definition of fully vaccinated. It is still two doses and two weeks after the second dose. So that is um, coming. And um, in terms of masking, we have received 40,003 ply masks for students, which is the equivalent of two per student, um, right from kindergarten through to grade 12. And those have been distributed to schools and distributed to students. And the non-fitted N95 masks have arrived um, for staff and they have also been distributed. They remain a choice for staff, not a requirement. Um, but they are available for staff who wish to use them in all of our workspaces. And that, Madam Chair, is my report this evening. Excellent. Are there any questions? Trustee Lutz. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, just with respect to masking, I'm wondering what's being done about enforcement and education, as I know um, through many different um, types of empirical evidence, we'll just put it that way, you know, many different avenues of knowing that there are challenges with proper wear, um, whether it's fit or um, um, of other challenges with wear during the day beyond, as we've talked about before, the period where students are um, unmasked for eating or even I have heard encouraged to take them off at other times, which is a different story. But the point, point of the matter remains, um, what will we be doing to um, enhance and encourage um, masking usage in, in the schools by by students in the um, near term. Thank you. So prior to the return to in-person learning, we did communicate with parents that the ministry had provided the three ply masks and we were highly recommending their use. They were distributed from kindergarten to grade 12. They are still recommended um, in kindergarten and required from grade one to grade 12. We also met with administrators and talked about reminding teachers to go over how to properly wear the mask with students and to be encouraging the students to wear the mask properly at all times um, when the students are under our supervision. Of course, for secondary students who are often not under the supervision of teachers, that is a little bit more difficult um, in terms of their use in the community. Thank you. We are, we're going to be very uh, close to finishing. I'm going to just march ahead because we may just get in under the wire. Otherwise, we will need to vote for an extra minute or two on our meeting uh, to follow our procedures. So thank you very much, Superintendent Tang. It was uh, moved by Trustee Lute, seconded by Trustee Morgan, that the Blue Water District School Board receive the school update report for information. All in favor? Thank you, that is carried. Um, we did receive a correspondence today that's been shared with you. Uh, the letter was received from the Elgin Market Public School home and school executive with concerns related to the return to in-person learning and a response uh, will be drafted. Trustee Johnstone. Yes, um, thank you very much. It was very interesting just to let you know um, in, in talking with their with the association and I know they had a vote is is um, having how they're going to address the letter. <laughs> And so we had some things where, no, you, you, even though I'm your representative, it has to go to the chair of the bo on be, you know, board on behalf of the board so that it actually is um, a part of, um, of our, um, our 
our agenda or a part, you know, of the board meeting. Um, and they there is some different suggestions in there, um, and they're really coming from very much a parental guardian voice. Um, and particularly, all, all you know, there was some things um, that they did talk about um, further last night, and they did have to do with the HEPA filters. Um, having said that, they made other suggestions. Anyway, I, I really appreciate um, that their concerns in expressing them to the board because it shows that they care and they care about students and they also care about the rest of the students and staff in our board. So thank, thank you. you. Are there any announcements from student trustees, trustees and trust? Oh. I see none. Uh, any out of uh, conferences or out of convention, out of district conventions? We do have OPSPA coming up. Go ahead. Um, yes, and we just received today from um, uh, TJ that we're having a Western Regional meeting coming up. Um, I, I know I have it in my calendar what the date is, but it's a reminder of all uh, trustees that of course you're welcome them to attend and remember it's by basically Zoom so you don't even have to leave your home to uh, attend and it's always um, uh, well received when trustees come and, and we have an opportunity to share right across our region. Thank you. Um, you have your calendar of events so if you could pay uh, attention to your meetings coming up and we did it. We made it just under the wire. So I'll be looking for a mover and a seconder that Blue Water District School Board adjourn at 9.28 p.m. I see Trustee McComb and Trustee Dawson all in favor. And thank you, everyone. Um, stay safe. And thank you very much. It was shared very well. <laughs> thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.